listen to this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, <clears throat> The last hour will not come until you find yourself that if you were among 20 young men, more or less, and you check their faces, you look at them all, and you are a believer, you're a good believer, and you looked at you know, a number of 20 or more or less, and found out that none of them fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it is time for the hour. What is he saying? He's saying when you see young men, there are many of them, and they're in large numbers together, hanging out in certain places or going together, and you cannot see any signs of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their faces as a whole, then wait for the last hour to come. We're talking about from the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ. What does this mean? In the nightclubs, they go in groups. In mixed weddings, singing and dancing, they're in groups. Going out to meet two or three girls, they're in groups. A concert happens where a singer comes along or a dancer or whatever, and they go in groups. Not one or two, in groups. They go to commit fahisha. They go to, you know, have argila all night until fajr time. Neglecting the Maghrib prayer, neglecting the Isha prayer, neglecting the Fajr prayer because as soon as they get home, they're too tired. They've got to give their body rights. So these young people full of energy and muscles and brains and, and strength, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put you as the leaders of this ummah, you are the responsible people. Wasting their time, wasting their bodies, wasting their energy, wasting their youth, wasting their health. On what? On just fulfilling the desires of this body and smoking things that kill you burning their money on things that kill them. Everywhere in the world they exist, brothers and sisters. Ar Rasul Sallallahu said, when you see this, then await for the last hour to come. And he said, when there will be more evil people, pe persons than the good ones, to the point when, listen to this, when the believers will hide themselves. يَسْتَخْفِي مِنْهُمُ الْمُؤْمِنْ كَمَا يَسْتَخْفِي الْمُنَافِقُ فِينَ الْيَوْمِ the believers will hide themselves too ashamed or too embarrassed or too scared to show themselves that they are believers. Just like the way Rasul Sallallahu said, just like the way hypocrites today hide themselves. Hypocrites. In Medina there were 17 hypocrites who used to look like Muslims on the outside, but they were actually spies there to plan and plot for the destruction of the Muslims. So they used to act like Muslims that they were actually disbelievers on the inside. There were 17 of them. No one knew about them except the Rasul Sallallahu and Hudayf ibn al-Yaman. Even Umar anhu asked, who are they? And he wouldn't tell him. They were like that. And he said, it will come a time where the believers will hide themselves from the, because of the amount of and the corruption that's out there. Wallahi, as a teacher, I see this among the students all the time, among the youth. At home, they're one thing. In the masjid, Allahu Akbar. But at school, with their friends, when they're out, totally different people, totally different. See, sisters, depends on who they're sitting with. Subhanallah, suddenly their language changes. From subhanallah, to talking about other people, to bagging other people, to cursing other people. What is this? For Rasul Sallallahu said, the believers begin to feel shy to show that they're believers. They're too afraid. They don't want to get up and feel proud of it. Abadan. Because they're afraid that they'll be blamed by their friends and told, look at you, you're acting like a Muslim now. And subhanAllah, I, what, one of the worst things we hear now is this trend where young people call each other this three letters um, uh, uh, um, acronym, FRG they call them, fake religious uh, guy or girl. I need to deter people away from trying to be religious. You find them, mashaAllah, they come from home, beautiful, modesty, character. And then they meet these other people and they get overwhelmed by the bullying, you know, mental bullying. And so they become corrupt themselves. The shame goes away from them as if they weren't Muslims at all. Our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now said, Al-Mahdi, the awaited Mahdi who will lead the Ummah of Islam, you all know who I'm talking about. There is a man called Al who is anointed Al-Mahdi, his name is Muhammad son of Abdullah, will come out and he will lead the Muslim Ummah of the world into justice. And he will fight the army of who the Prophet ﷺ called the army of someone called the Dajjal, the deceiver, the liar. 
and he will fill the Arab world, in other words, the Muslim world, because in those days of Rasul Sallallahu when he was telling this hadith, the majority of Islam was still in the Arab Peninsula before it actually spread out. So he's telling the Arabs, he says, in the Arab world, he will fill it with justice just as it was filled with oppression. Some scholars say it actually literally means the Arab countries because the majority of injustice will be in the Arab countries, namely Asham. He said when the Mahdi comes out, this Arab world will be filled with injustice. And you know what? Our Rasul Sallallahu tells us, he tells us in this hadith, this Ummah will always be under the protection of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And within and under his, under his protection, under his care, so long as its scholars and its reciters of the Qur'an do not become hypocrites only to please its leaders. And so long as the righteous people do not give fame to those who are criminals. And so long as the good of them, the good people, do not submit to the bad of its people. For when they do this, Allah will lift His care from them. And He will allow for the oppressors to be upon them. And they will oppress them in such a hardship, they will afflict upon them torture. And then poverty, poverty will afflict them as a nation. Does, is this not the case now in the Arab world? Yes, it is. Although there are people, mashallah, still standing with angels above them in a sham and the places like that, I know. There did come a time, and I have to say the truth, and I lived there for four years and saw and heard. There did come a time where people did leave their deen. Where people began to resort to corruption. Trust became like a prophet. People swore oaths on lying in order to make wealth and money. People began to follow the West. Poor people, they go and borrow to buy a very expensive watch or a very expensive suit only to look like they are important even though their mothers and fathers are starving. I saw this. And it was there when I saw people swearing at Allah and the religion. I never witnessed this here in a Western country from the Muslims. They were on drugs here. They might not pray. They might be the worst of the worst in relation to morals. But I've never heard a Muslim swear at the religion of Allah. We saw this. And since the sham are people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed this great value upon them, it is only a responsibility that people, us, we should adhere to the correct principles of our deen to become, because we are the role models. You know the prophets of Allah, when they made a small mistake, a human mistake, what happened? The, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yani, for example, Yunus salam, when he made a small mistake by leaving his people without permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah punished him so severely. Because the prophets, they know the reality, they're supposed to be role models. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes them, punishes them double, triple of us. And when they do good, Allah rewards them double, triple of us. So when you are a role model, then expect the affliction and the consequence to be more. Yes, I know there are children. I know that there are innocent people. Zainab radiallahu anha, the daughter of the, or the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi because he had also had a wife named Zainab. He once woke up from his bed with his face pale. And he said, Woe to the Arabs, the Arabs specifically, from a terrible a badness, a terrible evil that has come very near to them. This is 1,400 years ago. And he made this with his finger. He did a little ring and he said, The radam, the seal that has been placed around the Ajuj and Ma'juj, Gog and Magog, this much has been opened from it. Allahu A'lam, what this means for us. But what it does, what, it, what is important is that Zainab radiallahu anha, she said, Ya Rasulullah, anuhlaku wa fina salihun, will we be destroyed or will we suffer like this? And while there are among us those who are righteous and innocent, Rasul sallallahu said, Yes, idha kathur al-khabath, if immorality, immodesty, 
badness, evil, it expands and spreads and becomes the prevailing thing. So what will happen to these innocent, righteous people? Rasul said, يُبْعَثُ عَلَى نِيَّاتِهِمْ They'll be gathered on a day of judgment on what they died upon, on their good intentions. We're all going to die, the young and the old, whether you are in war or not in war, whether you are afflicted by catastrophes or not, whether you are in the perfect health or not, richest or poor, we have to meet death. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes a soul away and we look at it and think, why is Allah doing this? Be careful. Allah is wiser than you. Allah has a bigger plan than you know. You will have to know everything about everything. Allah has placed a plan that is light years ahead of what we can see right now. And when these youngsters go, maybe, maybe, I'll give you an example. Maybe Allah is taking these young ones because He doesn't want them to live more in this atrocity. Because maybe ahead of them is something greater. And these young people, Allah wants to reward them for their affliction to put them in Jannah straight away. Maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken these believers to give them the reward of shahada, of martyrdom, which is the greatest reward anyone can have. Dying under zulm, under oppression, to place them in the highest reward. Maybe Allah, maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves them so much that He will, cannot bear to let them even live another day. He wants them to Him straight away. When a Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was dying, he put his arms up to Allah and Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, I understood from him that he was saying, I was given the option of staying in this world or going to my Lord. And I said, Rabbi, he said, Rabbi, uridu Rabbi, my Lord, I want my Lord. I miss him. I miss him. Death is not a reward or a punishment for anybody. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows why this happens. And these people that we see, the sorrow is not upon them, wallahi al-azim. I know it looks terrible. The sorrow or the thought and the reflection is upon us. You know, inside of our own homes, with our family. Do you, a hus are you a husband who afflicts and oppresses your wife? Is the wife one who afflicts and oppresses her husband or your children? Do you waste food? Do you waste clothing? Do you waste money? I mean, the other day, a young child, he was eating a banana. And a little bit of it was left. He said, I don't eat the last bit. I said to them, if I brought you a child from Syria right now, and I showed you that this child hasn't eaten for a week, and they've got one more day to live, and that this little bit of banana could make them survive one more day, would you give it to them? They said, of course. I said, then why are you throwing it in the rubbish bin? We've, we, we make our plates of food so big, as though we live to eat and we're going to die if we don't eat to the, to the brink of our stomachs. And then if the food is not that good, we complain and complain and complain. If the coffee is really a little bit out, we complain and complain. If we don't have our dose for the morning, we say, Oh man, I haven't had my coffee. Sorry I've been angry. Sorry I've been swearing. Sorry I'm bad to you, husband, wife, children, because I haven't had my coffee this morning. They're called first world problems. First world. Maybe inshallah we'll give a little lesson about first world problems and compare it to third world problems. Snake Productions. <laughs>